I think we're ready to start. So welcome everyone. Uh, a great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. David Jones, who's from the Department of um, Anesthesia and Pain Management and Surgical Sciences. And with all the talk about the uh, replacement of the Leaven Hospital, David is going to talk about an early critic of the state of Dunedin Hospital, I believe. David. Thanks. Sir. Well, thank you for giving up your um, Thursday night for something like this. And um, I'll just uh, point out that I've tried to keep all the squeamishy type things out of my talk, the parts that are medical. Oh, okay. uh, oh, you want the skirmish bits? Okay, well, I'll see what I can come up with. But anyway, the, those who work in the uh, Dunedin Hospital will have walked past this corner many a time. I call it Radiology Corner, but it's um, actually the start of the John Borry uh, in, induced or inducted museum of uh, medical history bits. And there's a, an honours board sitting on there. Now, who hands up who's uh, had to look, stop and look at the names on it? Well, for a long time I hadn't either, but uh, one of my nursing colleagues at work asked me a question about somebody on there and what did something mean, so I went and had a look into it, and that's where this story began. And uh, it's a, an honours board for people who have um, uh, passed away, either in office on the left-hand side, and uh, those who uh, had served more than 10 years and passed away afterwards on the right-hand side. But uh, my slightly cryptic talk to Mike got corrupted in the ODT advertisement that made it think I was going to talk about the new hospital coming here, but in fact I'm talking about the new hospital of the 1892-3 era. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody that thought they were going to get the other could leave now if they don't want the rest of it. Now that's the honours board, it's got some names on there that uh, are hard to read on the um, slide, but I've taken the top four and I'm going to... For practical purposes take the top two out, although Isaiah de Zouche, uh, did deliver anaesthesia here as a uh, doctor of uh, children's diseases and uh, quite an interesting uh, story in itself, but I'll leave the other two and my subject really is uh, Dr. Joseph Kloss. And uh, I've left Dr. Monson partly visible there because we'll meet him a few more times tonight. Um, so Dr. Joseph uh, Osborne Kloss was, uh, came from a pioneer Scottish family to Otago and was the first Otago Medical School uh, student to start his uh, studies here and go to Edinburgh and complete them and come back uh, qualified with a Master of Surgery which was um, a bit more than what we tend to get out of six years from our local study. We get a Bachelor of Surgery. They uh, wouldn't trust us to cut yet. Um, so an overview of what I'm going to do is going to talk a little bit about his, his family background, uh, not too much genealogy, um, the way they got here, some of the medical stuff uh, connected with that, then his, a bit about his Invercargill uh, return as a surgeon, and then uh, the Dunedin hospitals that were the part of his story that he was connected with, some vignettes out of his case books, which I'll mention where they came from later. Nothing about his postgraduate thing except 10 years later he updated his um, Master of Surgery to a, an MD in Edinburgh and uh, something about his involvement in organisations and charities and things in the region. But most importantly for the main part of the story is uh, what, what was said by him. I'm only going to give his version of it. There are others that submitted to a commission of inquiry about the poor state of Dunedin Hospital in, 19, in 1890 and the sundown, which is, of course, his passing. So Joseph uh, was born in uh, 1853 in Glasgow. Uh, his father, Henry, and mother, uh, Jane Gunning, married in, in Belfast. And just note that, because uh, there's record evidence for that, but there's some interesting asides. He was the fourth of five, maybe six children. There's one that looks as if it uh, might have died in infancy, 1855. And there is another one that... Uh, a researcher in the UK has uh, linked with them, and it's slightly mysterious, so we'll leave that bit for further research. But 1853 is uh, the year in which uh, Queen Victoria enjoyed uh, chloroform a la reine and said it was a delightful beyond measure experience. It's also the uh, time of the Crimean War, so Joseph uh, came in at that. Henry uh, came to New Zealand ahead of his uh, family 
uh, there is indirect evidence that he was a sawyer, uh, and elsewhere some uh, researchers have said he was a shipwright, and they might, I've, I've looked those up and I think they might be overlapping a wee bit, and uh, the uh, vessel that he came on is uh, reputed to be the Robert Henderson, although I have not found uh, clear proof that that's true, that's, that's word of mouth stuff through family type um, uh, information and settled out in Port Thomas and Deadwood Bay. Um, there were invitations for people to come out on this boat uh, to there from the Glasgow Herald and the Aberdeen Herald but it had a reputation for being uh, uh, well known in the trade having made the quickest passage on record to New Zealand. So if you wanted to avoid too much sickness, quickness was the key to it according to some later uh, reports. And that's what it looked like. Um, Henry joined a, a, a bunch of adults and some children who came out and arrived in September at Port Chalmers. This painting by, um, I think it's Robert uh, McGowan, uh, shows the same boat in Port Chalmers a year later. And that's uh, pretty much what Port Chalmers looked like a few years within the time uh, Henry arrived. Oh, what's that? Don't bother reading all of that, but there was quite a health issue related to this boat, and uh, there were 40 cases of scarlet fever on that one, a lap trip, of which four died. But So they got put into quarantine as soon as they arrived, and the bedding and clothing and that of uh, various uh, uh, passengers had to be uh, dealt with appropriately, and they were granted a temporary place in Deborah, Way for, Deborah Bay sorry, for washing themselves and their uh, clothing and bedding and burning that which was declared unsuitable. But notice they had a police officer stationed to keep a check on them, make sure they complied. And this gentleman at the bottom who is the medical uh, officer of health out there, we will meet again later, Edward Hume. So the following year, uh, Joseph's mother is recorded in the uh, uh, Scotland census uh, together with her children, and that's where the indirect evidence is that uh, she was, he was a sawyer by what she gave. Uh, shortly after that, uh, she and the five uh, departed on the storm cloud for <coughs> arrival to uh, Otago and arrived in the middle of the winter. <coughs> area. So the, the Otago witness seemed to have very little other news to report other than the comings and goings of the boats and the people that were on them and you can find lists of all the passengers of each of the voyages for uh, a large number of them. Uh, but the hallmark about this voyage which they uh, brought out was the 84 day port passage which was pretty great <coughs> at those times. So, they also made uh, compliments that they would have uh, uh, absorbed off the passengers on the boat for the captain and his uh, uh, pleasant voyage. Uh, everybody spoke highly of the no grumbles. The uh, Otago Witness article made some snide comments about another company's, uh, another line's boats, but that's irrelevant tonight. And uh, it, they had this conclusion that it's generally on slow ships that people became sick, so the, that's why that boat didn't seem to have as much sickness as the one that Henry came on. Uh, we can leave that one. Now Henry Cross, that's Joseph's father, can be tracked through electoral rolls and uh, uh, these uh, uh, a, a decade after he'd actually arrived he's shown as staying in this uh, block for a period of time and then having a, another block of land, I'll show you where they are in a minute, um, but listed as a farmer. Uh, so for reference that triangle is Mihiwaka railway station, just so you know where we are and the red uh, triangle there is um, where they, he first had his uh, freehold property listed. Later on he's uh, got the, uh, this listed to his name, quite a large uh, piece of property up on the tip there. And uh, I don't know anything more about what he farmed, it's just listed as a farmer. I could not find anything positive about Joseph's schooling where he went uh, for his primary and secondary education, but uh, from his obituary it was stated that he uh, was um, evinced a great mathematical ability and that that was reputedly helped him in his surgical world. Uh, he matriculated uh, and became ready for 
entering the embryonic medical school at the age of 22, which is about the age here we actually graduate. It's uh, quite late. So it seemed like he might have uh, marked a bit of time, which people did before the, they went into the medical school. I started waiting for it to open up. Um, and that sort of matriculated entry uh, was later proposed to be much more stringent. It wasn't hard enough. This uh, book is uh, very informative about the medical school as a whole, and uh, it was, in fact, the furthest flung colonial medical school at the time. And the next closest, the next furthest flung was in Melbourne, and after that, Canada. Uh, the governor of the province, the superintendent of the province, was James McAndrew, and uh, he was the one that was pushing for the university to add a medical school. The, the things that it actually needed to get it off the ground was recognition by British uh, medical authorities, so people could be registered, and an anatomy act, because uh, they weren't allowed to dissect, well, I, should, I think they might have breached that, um, and a hospital for decent clinical access. So there was consultation in other um, other places uh, about what should be in a two years of medical preparation before going off to Edinburgh or one of the other English universities to finish their, their teaching. They set about searching for a, an anatomy professor to kick it off and as it happened uh, Dr Millen Cotry from uh, the UK, uh, I think he was last in, uh, in uh, Lancashire, was actually in the country, it stated elsewhere that he was here for his health reasons, whatever they were, and they, they recruited him. And by the middle of the following year, he gave the inaugural lecture of the Otago Medical School. They had, uh, at the beginning of the next year, only two students. One of them uh, siphoned off to do law fairly quickly, and that left um, uh, one student uh, for the anatomy, one professor, one classroom, and one cadaver. <laughs> One cadaver? I thought they needed that anatomy act first, but anyway. Uh, so, in terms of getting enough material for dissection, uh, this uh, Dr. Edward Hume, whom we met before as a uh, quarantine man, uh, he was in charge of the Dunedin Hospital as well, <coughs> with 150 patients, and stated somewhere that uh, anatomical, an anatomical subject could be procured with unusual facility. <laughs> that sounds like digging up graves. <coughs> so there was a delay in that uh, passing of the anatomy act and uh, Millen Cotry got frustrated and resigned. So they looked further again and uh, just, just to take notice of this because it will come back later, the, the, the first six students were actually around and noticed that there's a couple here that were really described as observers. I don't know quite how they got there but uh, Mr. Schooler became a journalist, Mr. Saul Solomon withdrew later and he became a King's Counsel. Um, Legal. Yeah. So there was only uh, Joseph and uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Lowe, who haven't been able to find anything more out about yet, and uh, uh, one, of, one of those uh, withdrew for a period of time and left only the one that we saw before. So they eventually recruited uh, Professor John Halliday Scott, for whom was the building down the road named after, and uh, he ran the first anatomy class there in 78. I thought other sources said it was 77, I don't think it matters too much. Um, these are a subsequent group of students, and there's Joseph Kloss there. Please note that he's only two years younger than his professor, and he died um, uh, two years before his professor, but that's a side issue. The actual location of this first uh, uh, medical school activity was down in what became the old exchange building. Uh, some of you will possibly remember in its later form, <coughs> just another view, but do note the horse and carts. I can't see a motor anywhere in sight. And to cover the rest of the story about Joseph, I found absolutely nothing out about whether he had a vehicle or not, but have to infer that he probably did. Um, and a different view, slightly later, of the, uh, what was the old exchange building. But if you want to take uh, Shannon McFarlane's artistic view, you know, quite a few years later, this is um, in a book of uh, old Dunedin buildings. And uh, to note that uh, this has got in its corner by courtesy Mr. John Borry, who was the museum uh, uh, starter. So Joseph graduated in 1882 with his uh, degree in medicine and surgery. 
And he first uh, worked in an asylum in West Cumberland for a, a period of time. How he got there, I don't know, but uh, he gave that as evidence to the commission. Later, he was 29 years of age, which is quite a bit older than our, our graduates. Uh, but, but the same year, he, mar he married uh, a widow about 13 years his senior, uh, and uh, that she she was in the place uh, where he did this uh, first job in the asylum at uh, Cumberland Parliament, which was uh, not too far from the Scotland where he had uh, been born and trained. Uh, so the locations he went to after he graduated are um, shown in this and the evidence for them. He, the first one's mentioned already. Uh, he came back to New Zealand to work in Invercargo first off and uh, the um, the electoral roles there listing me as a surgeon. Uh, the two lower um, points are two residences that he lived in in Dunedin. So one of those was four doors along from Knox Church and uh, there you can see the location just up the road there and he stayed there for quite a few years and then uh, I thought some people depending on the audience might be interested to who advertised in the same uh, uh, directory of New Zealand residents. Um, this is uh, uh, 281 is his address in, uh, in uh, George Street, which is just by Albany Street corner. But Methvins and Co, that famous uh, uh, industrial place in Dunedin, was uh, advertised on the same page. So the hospitals that he was connect well, that were connected with this story, the first one doesn't relate to Joseph at all. It was uh, down in the octagon. There's a good picture of it in. Um, Jim Clayton's book, uh, it sounded as if it acted as an asylum for what they called five lunatics in the earliest times before they got other types of patients in there. Not a very nice term, but that's what it's recorded as. But they, they had the international exhibition here in, the, in Dunedin and the building that uh, was built for that was subsequently converted into the, uh, the next Dunedin hospital. And uh, the, the story of Joseph Kloss uh, and others in the uh, submissions to the Commission sits in between these, these two. The rest I don't think you need to worry too much except uh, one of those is uh, used to be called the Psych Services and it's now the Management Block that you might consider an appropriate combination. <laughs> uh, so there's the, um, the, the old exhibition um, building off the front of John Clayton's book and there's a lot more details in that about uh, the various hospitals and the, the next hospital that was built alongside. A slightly different view out of the uh, Alexander Turnbull Library. Um, looks like it's been done as an etching to me, uh, but the, a, a photographic view some years later where it's uh, acquired a fence and a few normal accoutrements of the street like power poles. So Joseph's mother died while he was down in uh, Invercargill and you can't read that very easily, I'll give you a translation, but just notice his older brother, James Gunning Kloss, was the informant, and uh, she died at Deborah Bay, which they had uh, resided in since arrival, really. Um, but of peritonitis, which Joseph probably had an awful lot of experience himself, but notice that uh, uh, his brother was able to uh, identify um, her, her father's uh, occupation as a farmer, certified by one Dr. Delatour, whom we'll meet a couple of times yet, and um, the knowledge that they were married in Belfast when she was 20, and I'll contrast that with uh, something a bit later. Um, so the Commission of Inquiry into, um, into the state of Dunedin Hospital is uh, really the next part of this story. Dr. Ferdinand Batchelor, noting that it was his son, Dr. Stanley Batchelor, uh, they overlapped at some points. Uh, Dr. Ferdinand Batchelor had made uh, submissions to the trustees of the uh, Dunedin Hospital uh, that there were some uh, criticisms about its state, and the trustees duly passed it up the line, meaning to the government in Wellington. But, the two main complaints were about the defects in the sanitary uh, condition and that these were so serious as to be a source of grave danger to what they called the inmates. <laughs> so the report of that commission is uh, available online in this uh, appendix uh, which was submitted in the following year. 
Um, it was um, commissioned by the the, uh, the governor, who was um, uh, uh, Earl uh, Earl of Onslow. It sounds a very English sort of place, but they appointed um, uh, Sir James Hector and Edgar Paul Carew as uh, commissioners, the latter being a resident magistrate of the colony of New Zealand. Greetings, it says in the invitation. Now, the rest of uh, the, the bits in here I'll need to read to you shortly, but you'll see there who's who of who got dragged before the uh, commission to give evidence. And uh, take note that this is an adversarial process. Uh, the person who actually interrogated the people who were uh, submitting that it was a bad place and needed fixing was uh, none other than Mr. Solomon, Saul Solomon himself, who had uh, been one of the earliest. Uh, uh, short-time students. But you'll see Dr. Monsell, who we've met once, we'll meet again yet, some uh, well-known names and buildings in this institute around here, and uh, Dr. Truby King, of course. So the inquiry took place in August uh, 1890, and that's the law firm that uh, Saul Solomon started and still exists today. Uh, two years after Joseph graduated, that began. And if, I, if you'll bear with me, I'll read you selected parts. I haven't selected them to bias the story, but there's too many pages to read at all, and it won't project very well. But Dr. Foss was sworn and examined by Mr. Solomon. What is your name? Joseph Osborne Foss. What is your title? Bachelor of Surgery, Master. Oh, sorry, Bachelor of Medicine, Master of Surgery, Edinburgh. Uh, you were appointed as a delegate from New Zealand to the Melbourne Congress, were you not? The legal language, were you not? Uh, it was the Adelaide Congress, actually. Uh, what year was that? I think it was 1888. That was the first medical congress in Australia, and then I was local secretary for New Zealand for the next congress in Melbourne. And I suppose you've been through a good many hospitals. I have seen the number of in, in Australia and New Zealand. The Bristol Hospital I have not seen, but I visited the other principal ones. Mr Solomon, all of, the, of all the hospitals you have seen in Australasia, which is the worst? Dr Foss, I should say that of the important hospitals, the Dunedin Hospital is the worst constructed I have seen. Mm. Have you ever been in a hospital of the same size as Dunedin Hospital, which was worse than this? I do not think so. <laughs> Do you consider its sanitary condition at present to be fairly satisfactory? It is not satisfactory. Do you think the defects are slight or of a serious character? Some of them are pretty serious. As regards wards, there is not a proper ward in the whole building, that is, as far as modern hospital structure goes now. What are the faults? Dr. Kloss, well, the faults are principally in the ventilation and light. Perfect cross ventilation cannot be procured. What do you say about the position of the patients in the hospital? No patient should be under a window. Notwithstanding, <coughs> in, in my early days, they were put out on balconies in the sun. Have you noticed the walls, floors, ceilings, and so on? Dr. Kloss, they are very favourable to the reception of germs. Can you tell me what is the minimum bed space that, in your opinion, should be allowed to patients, say, in the surgical cases? I think there should be from four feet to five feet between each bed, say five feet. And that's not feet. Do you agree with Dr. Delator, we meet again, that the thing to be desired most is frequent change of air? Yes. Uh, and then there's a long dialogue about complications of cases in there, and uh, Dr. Foss um, says that the surgeon would need to be prepared to meet complications. By what would these complications be caused? Probably by the unhealthy state of the wards. That is to say, if an operation was not carried out in proper style and with strict listerism, we'll follow that up shortly, would it follow that um, although there is a possibility of septic trouble from the insanitary conditions of the wards, that would arise in any given case? I scarcely understand you, says Dr. Foss. We will put it this way. There is a fear of septic poisoning arising. Yes. 
And if strictless tourism was carried out, might that be avoided? Dr. Voss, if list tourism in its entirety was carried out, it might be avoided. There is also a certain danger of septic trouble, yes. And then there would be an outbreak of septicemia, yes. Now, now do you know Dr. Batchelor? Yes. As a practitioner, yes. Is he, is he careful? Yes. And skillful? Yes. Good CV recommendation. I suppose it's a battle of antiseptic precautions on the one side and germs on the other. Yes. And there's a discussion about the death rate in the hospital of around about 10% in the Dunedin Hospital. And moving on, Mr Chapman, the antagonistic side to the complaints from the medical staff by Dr Batchelor and evidence from Dr Delatour and the boss, etc. He uh, said, then, several years ago, you came to the conclusion that it was an unsafe place in which to perform operations. Yes. Was it the opinion of the medical staff who have been cutting and slashing away there uh, for years? Dr. Floss, my conclusion is not their conclusion. Uh, Mr. Chapman, the lawyer for the trustees, then are you playing a lone hand? Apparently Dr. Batchelor has not held it because he has performed these operations up to last month. I think he meant held that opinion. Dr. Kloss in reply, I have nothing to do with what Dr. Batchelor did. And then Dr. Monsall was uh, examined the following Monday. So that finishes that little section about the uh, evidence before the commission. I think we've got the story. They thought the hospital wasn't very good. We've had the same problems in the place where we operate over the road in the recent years where we've had water on top of the instruments and stuff making it uh, somewhat unsafe. Uh, so a little bit about the germ theories and the listerism and all that was referred to there. The Commission has heard a lot more than I have read to you about that. And here's Joseph Lister, who is a Yorkshireman with the Chair of Surgery in Glasgow, who uh, incidentally happened to die the same year as uh, Dr. Floss. And the, the considerations were about poisoning, blood poisoning, erysipelas, which is sort of spreading uh, infective uh, problems, typically on the face, uh, pyema, which is um, uh, blood poisoning, you might say, septicemia and hospital gangrene. And the, <coughs> after reading the, the works of Pasteur, he accepted the, the likelihood that these infective processes were caused by airborne bacteria, hence all the discussion about ventilation at the Dunedin Hospital. So they, he had learned the properties of carbolic acid, phenol, which I had put in my eye in my young days, still around. Um, and the action of killing bacteria or preventing them getting there in the first place. And the carbolic soap dressings were quite common. So uh, just a little vignette of um, the microscope that uh, Joseph Lister uh, has had gifted to him by his father, who was a famous physicist and sitting in the Science Museum of London. And uh, taking one of the first vignettes out of Dr. Toss's case book for uh, consideration of uh, the application of the thinking about hysterism and antisepsis and the like. Not, I can't read it all, but I did note how nice and neat the writing was in the case books at the time. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, an 1893 case which would probably be in the hospital that was the result of the commission of inquiry they had the 1990, the new hospital, 1992-3, and this one was in, the, in that time. So this poor young boy of um, 12 was cleaning the windows at school and he stepped on the lid of the copper and fell into the hot water, burning his lower limbs. The f at the school, the first thing they did was put flour all over his legs. Later he was uh, uh, embalmed in linseed oil, linseed policies, <coughs> lint soap with water and finally Condi's fluid, which some of you will be familiar with probably. He didn't get admitted to hospital until 16 days post-injury. And there on the following day they started dressing his legs twice daily with weak carbolic acid as per the, the principles of Joseph Lister and Listerism. Being a pain specialist as well, I had to note that things about him in very severe pain through his hospitalisation probably were pretty bad even before he got there. So they kept changing the, the poisons on the dressings, but carbolic oil, uh, carbolised oil, gauze, 
charcoal poultices, I've no idea what they are for, but um, and deconcoction of poppy heads. And the gutta perch is something that comes from a, like a rubbery tree in uh, Malaya, Malaya and uh, they soaked in more carbolic. By the 6th of July, which is quite a while since he was admitted, um, he's uh, looking very ill. So they, Dr. Poss got on with some skin grafting, which I was amazed. I didn't really study the uh, background of when skin grafting came around, but look at the donors. First leg was done with 13 grafts taken from five boys. Mm. Don't know whether they were consenting volunteers or <laughs> threatened with something or not. And then a, a couple of days later, they do the other leg with skin grafts, which were shaved off with a razor from a leg about to be amputated. There are some pretty elaborate descriptions and uh, drawings in the in the records, and this is just uh, to show you where they put the the, the salvaged skin, the, the red parts, uh, skin skin grafts. And the, the temperature chart looks pretty um, uh, uh, arousing to one's suspicions if you know what that means in terms of infection. So this was the hospital of 1893 result of Joseph's uh, his, uh, colleagues, friends, uh, submissions to the uh, commission. And uh, we've got a deja vu, but it's going to take 10 years to fix our, our uh, poor conditions in parts of our hospital. Now I'll go on to a few anecdotes about Dr. Poss's uh, life experiences and the like. This one here is, first of all, just note uh, yes. a well-known hotel at Queenstown, the person was reported to die from falling down the stairs, but unfortunately there was this young man who got across saw with abdominal pain at home and he recommended a particular medicine to be given uh, in a teaspoonful dose and unfortunately the mother gave him a tablespoonful and Dr. Cross visited the following day and noticed the effects of uh, overdose of this medicine and arranged for him to be admitted to hospital, intending to operate on him later for whatever the mischief was in his abdomen. Unfortunately, the young man died first. But uh, mixing up doses is still a problem that people have to uh, pay attention to to this day. And uh, there's a 3 to uh, 1 ratio, three times too much uh, of that medicine given there. Uh, the first of Dr. Kloss's case books uh, uh, for the period of 10 years in the 83-93 time. Uh, he would have been in Invercargill there and I didn't actually note whether they were transferred with him from Invercargill. The location wasn't quite clear. But the longest record in there is six pages. Most of them are one or two pages. And this, this particular one is about a 32-year-old bootmaker from Invercargill uh, who was admitted there and uh, had some uh, problems with a, a big swelling on the left side of his chest and he was able to feel his heart beating on the right side of his chest. So uh, he came into hospital and Dr. Foss uh, did some tapping, which was like draining off fluid with cannulae and needle type things. And then later uh, took him to have a, a major operation under chloroform anesthesia, which lasted one hour. Uh, note the uh, descriptions in there. Dr. Kloss tapped the patient against the plane and removed three and a half pints of the, I couldn't read the word, but it didn't start with a P, it wasn't pus. Uh, after the tapping, a violent fit of coughing came on, for which uh, the patient had some brandy. Now, take note of brandy, it's a recurrent. Um, this patient actually stayed for 13 weeks and uh, there was two months between the, the operation and actually being up for one hour out of bed. So he's pretty, pretty laid back. But there's a few more things about this procedure. Don't read the whole lot. The bits in yellow are the bits that matter. He performed the main operation with Dr. Hogg giving chloroform. And about sometime in the middle, with after a bit of cutting a ribbon stuff, this time the patient, who was a hard one to anesthetize, nearly went off from asphyxia. But Dr. Hogg pulled out his tongue and the patient got better. <laughs> the total removal of fluid that would count the stuff from tapping beforehand and this operative procedure was one and a half gallons. Imagine that in the chest. And they dressed the wounds afterwards with iodoform and toe, which is another sort of antiseptic type procedure iodine. 
And just a reminder of how much a gallon is, there was one and a half of those. Now the, the prescription after the operation in, in an anaesthetic and surgical practice, you've got a, a lot higher interest in post-operative nausea and vomiting. And uh, this was the, the, the prescription written for that problem. Uh, this prescription was to allay the sickness which had uh, been prevalent since the operation, and I'm not surprised. But uh, with the help of uh, Dr. Uh, Brian McMahon, I uncovered uh, what the true nature of Nepenthe because I thought it had something else in it from what he told me. It's actually a morphine preparation. Nepenthe is about getting rid of the un... Uh, uh, I Terry will know a lot more about it. Uh, a goddess of getting rid of the unpleasantness in the world, and I suppose morphine would do that. But a few other things. That, uh, skill A is uh, squill, which uh, we still have in cough mixtures over the counter to this day. Uh, some menthol water added up to a certain amount to make it up to a certain amount, and you had to take a gram of that every two hours. I have no idea whether it worked, the records doesn't, doesn't say. <coughs> so, moving on to an unfortunate young four-year-old boy with hydatidosis. And that, that previous case, it didn't say that it was hydatid, so one could have been suspicious, but he did get that on the hospital, it said. So this uh, young boy was Frederick, aged four, 1993, uh, sorry, 1993, and, and he, he made a clinical diagnosis of hydatidosis. He had big swellings in his abdomen. And uh, after aspirating the fluid, uh, fluid, it said in the record that it was uh, confirmed to be hydatid, so which makes me think that they must have had microscopic examination of fluid to, to come to that. So he operated, and Dr. Hogg again administered chloroform. This patient nearly died by the sound of it from the thing, but the patient became so weak that an injection of strychnine, another toxic poison, was given into one arm. And when he showed signs of collapse later, they injected ether into the other eye. And the quantity, uh, it looks like 7 to 10 ounces, which I think sounds an awful lot to me. He was uh, getting chloroform through the respiratory tract. And they dressed his wounds with iodoform. He was restless for a long time after. And I don't know what the sweet sleeping draft is, it's not stated. But everywhere that's yellow on that left-hand record is where this child of four years of age was given brandy. <laughs> Um, uh, every hour, every hour, every two hours, with eggs and milk, and etc. He slept very little despite that. So I worked out that he had um, well over 16 grams of brandy in four or five days. Uh, probably well over because you can't tell how many times the, the two hourly was administered. I just took a, a couple of them. Uh, on the last day, he had uh, a one gram of brandy and died at five o'clock in the morning. Um, but that was a hydatid cyst that Dr. Poss did perform a post-mortem, and there were hydatid cysts in both lobes of the liver and the one at the, uh, the back as well. So, and it had been pushed right down to the, to the lower part of the abdomen. So Joseph Poss had some military affiliations, uh, He's first noted to have been just appointed to the honorary surgeon to the uh, Southland Hussars, and that was in 1885. About uh, a few years later, he's uh, promoted to a commission of uh, surgeon, a lieutenant surgeon, same group of um, people. And then we have a list here, I'll tell you where that came from later, but there's a list of uh, military uh, doctors of the early times in there, and Joseph's uh, a surgeon captain by 1898. And I'll take that off for a minute. Does anybody spot another uh, celebrated name in that list? You have to shout it out. I mean, it's Gerald. Okay, uh, I don't know anything about him. Um, uh, uh, James Fitzgerald. Fleming. Hmm? William Alexander Fleming. Okay, well, I don't know anything about him either. <laughs> <laughs> but Bob Pooper, maybe that's a topic for another day. Um, but this man here, anybody recognise where he uh, where he was? Christchurch. Christ, in Christchurch, correct. But he was this man here in the, in the exhibition in Te Papa, uh, Bigger Than Life, and uh, uh, Percival uh, Fleming. Uh, continued quite a long practising life after his experiences in World War I. 
So Joseph gave some lectures to uh, uh, military groups and uh, this one was about the effect of modern small arm on the human body. Now I can find nowhere where he would have gained much experience of that. The modern small arm here in Otago, that even in the military sense, um, I'm, I'm still thinking. Um, he was an early, in his early days in the cargo, a member of the Southern Cross Lodge, in, uh, inducted in 1885, uh, which you can just see down there in the, in the last bit. And he, uh, in his um, quiet times, he uh, conjectured that the, Mason, the Freemasonry should have a utility, and that uh, in this talk to the uh, lodge here in Dunedin, the one in Maury Place, it was. Um, but to quite a large audience, it said he, he put up his own scheme for an orphanage for the children of Masons who might happen to be in these circumstances. And he went around the whole country with that theme. Um, the first one is the Auckland Star. This is three months, uh, well, two, about two months after Queen Victoria had died. So he's proposing that it be called the Victoria Institution. And uh, basically, he was selling his scheme around the country, and so did the newspapers presented in many places. Those are just a couple. Um, the, the book, one of the books on the early practitioners uh, has this about uh, Joseph amongst, um, amongst those and connected with the lodge and this is his uh, deputy uh, district grand master of the Grand Lodge of Otago in Southland. He also had affiliations with um, St John Ambulance and he was uh, in his fairly early days uh, 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 first honorary surgeon to the Dunedin Division and then later he became the first chief surgeon to the whole of the New Zealand district of uh, St John until his death. That's taken from a book uh, uh, from uh, Roy Rex White Sinclair, which some of you may be familiar with, I'll show you that later. Here's a, a, a coroner's case that Joseph was involved with uh, for a young boy of nine years who drowned in the Leith stream. The, the, the friends pulled him out and took him to the Scotia Hotel. I'm not quite sure where that is, so I haven't uh, looked it up. Anybody got that one? It seemed like quite a long way to take somebody who's drowned to try and get help anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, they um, made efforts to restore uh, animation and uh, doctors were telephoned for and arrived at the Scotia Hotel. None other than Dr. Coetry and Dr. Foss, but they were unsuccessful. And Dr. Coetry uh, deposed to the coroner that uh, with the assistance of Dr. Foss, they continued restorative measures for uh, longer than was usual and after there was any reasonable hope of success. Uh, I did like to draw that out mostly for the fact that they were telephoned with some of them and uh, arrived. So that's where I think they probably didn't come on horseback. Most likely he had a motor but I still haven't really covered that. What restorative measures would they have used? Any ideas? Frankie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, they probably needed that afterwards. Well, uh, around earlier times, blowing smoke with the bellows in the anus was one of the efforts that uh, had been used. When I was at primary school, we learned both the Sylvester and the Holger Nielsen methods, each one on the back, one on the front, uh, with compression of the chest, but not much about uh, blowing uh, air into the lungs and nothing at all about cardiac compressions. But I, I was pleasantly surprised to see how early this man in the Royal Free in uh, UK had um, devised this method of um, putting 12 times per minute pressures on the chest, uh, the front, so the person was supine, to a chant to get the timing right, thou must stay alive, thou must stay alive, aha, aha, thou must stay alive. <laughs> Can you imagine doing that with CPA? <laughs> but, Around about then, there are methods developing for mouth, uh, mouth ventilation, uh, not yet much about uh, compression. So a further case is uh, quite interesting, mostly for the artistry and the records. Uh, this is a 37-year-old uh, married lady with um, uh, a ventral hernia, which is in the front, below the umbilicus and in the front, the muscles spread apart and the hernia of the uh, organs inside can come through. And interestingly, she was uh, coming from the place where uh, Dr. Cross's wife came from. So the appearance of the abdomen is described by the clerk, and I have to point out that it does not appear these records are written by Dr. Cross at all. They have, they have the names of the uh, clerk usually up in the top corners. 
Some of them were, like Dr. Hogg, they were obviously resident types. But they're still a little pretty good readable writing. And uh, the first diagram is uh, this one here, to try and give a, a, a size uh, estimation. And uh, it says the sac was open, the bowels and the mantle were matted together, they were freed up, the edges of the muscles were brought together with strong wire sutures, which were left in for five days. And uh, after which time the union was firm and strong, which seems quite impressive, really, for just five days. Weeks. Weeks. Oh, sorry, did I? Weeks. Oh, sorry, thank you. That's not impressive at all. <laughs> <laughs> and just to enlarge the picture they have of what the anatomy and the bits and pieces that were in the ventral sac itself. And I'm going to change track now to back to Joseph's father. This would be one of the. This would be the last photo taken of him around 1905, with four generations of his family. So first of all, we've got uh, Joseph's sister Charlotte, uh, who married, whoops, who married um, uh, William Hitchcock Stevens, who was a lighterman, been on the Thames, came and did something <coughs> similar around here, and. Uh, her son, James Gunning Stevens, who was, became a well-known draper at the north end of the city, and uh, uh, Henry's grandson, great-grandson, sorry, Osborne Gunning Stevens. Now note the word, the name Osborne appears again, it appears several times through this family, but we can't find where exactly it comes from, and he became an arbitration court judge. So shortly after that photo was taken, the following year, uh, Henry Cross, Joseph's father, died. Notice that the residence of his death was Joseph's house, and um, <coughs> you can't read most of that again, so I've got the translation here. Um, he was uh, 89, pleurisy, senile debility for a month beforehand, so that's in Joseph's house. Um, but interestingly, jo presumably Joseph was the informant, given that his father died in his house. He doesn't know the names of his uh, maternal grandparents uh, or their occupation. Uh, and he also didn't know where his parents were married, whereas his brother, when his mother died, put down Belfast. So it's interesting that Dose has been a little bit um, either forgetful or not close to that part of the story. Uh, 281 George Street is there, but that's not where this happened. They renumbered all the, all the buildings. And in fact, that's the, the building of 281, which you're all familiar with. Uh, several doctors have lived in there and some medical practices and even dental practices have taken place from that particular building. Uh, it later got renumbered, so the numbers don't help you very much, but in a, in a 23 directory, Dr. Delatour is the resident, in residence there, that's after any of died. Now, regarding it, uh, role in the University of Otago, uh, well, another f uh, Illuminati of the university, uh, Dr. Louis Barnett, uh, lecturer in surgery, went off on a sabbatical of 12 months. Uh, Dr. Kloss was appointed in his stead to be uh, a lecturer on surgery. Um, we can forget that. Now this is the second of the case books of uh, Joseph and uh, it covers that short period of four years. Uh, it happens to reside in the Archives New Zealand building only five doors up the road from where he lived, where he was living when he died. Uh, and oh, just to be a bit extra, there's the windows that you might remember seeing on the side of that other building. They're still the same. That's the current day picture. For this particular case, George um, lifted something heavy and uh, felt something suddenly go out in his groin and his Tapanui doctor put a truss on for the hernia which didn't work very well and he came up to have uh, an operation from Dr. Kloss under ether this time by Dr. Brown. Uh, a little bit uh, told about how the operation was done in the record, but I put it, this one here for a different reason. Uh, note the sort of materials that they were using in the operation. Uh, they used silk sutures, uh, silk white came up right into modern times, but kangaroo tendons, uh, something that was unreadable, was drawn together with kangaroo tendons, and uh, a bit more fine silk, but the wounds were actually closed up with horsehair and I've read horsehair suturing in quite a few of the records. Unfortunately, the patient's progress is not very profound. Uh, five days later, he's just uh, declared to have died. 
there's no, there's no follow-up information between the operation and how it was on a day-by-day basis. Flip the Diamond Jubilee at the uh, founding of Otago, there's a new pavilion built at the Dunedin Hospital, uh, what they call the Ward Pavilion, and uh, there's a whole lot of people in the celebration. Now I think that is still the same bit that's there now. The plus seem to have changed its windows and things. People recognise that? Yes. It, it, I, if you go and look at the two pictures, they don't look so identical in the background that they could have done a lot of revamping of that. And that, of course, is the site services man slash management suite at the moment. But the trustees at the time were none other than Mr. Saul Solomon again, chairman of the uh, board of trustees, and Dr. Ferdinand Batchelor alongside him. So that, um, this is one of the wards in that pavilion, and I remember going into that ward when I first started here and other similar. Uh, I'm sure there are other people here that remember them further back than me. So Dr. Cross had a lot of connections with charitable things, and this particular one is uh, uh, an aid board which was running the 4th Street Maternity Hospital, of which he was the honorary senior medical officer. I didn't understand the statement in this newspaper item from the Otago witness said that 19 persons were admitted and 20 were discharged. It looked like they pulled one out of the side of the other. Um, but it does say that there were 20 births for months. It's probably a mis misstatement uh, uh, for that. We had 250 births since it had opened. And there's a bit more about Dr. Cross saying how the, both the building and equipment were in a thoroughly sanitary condition in contrast to his previous statements. Now this one's the last medical register that Dr. Foss uh, appeared in the year before he died. But, um, you'll see that he's uh, listed there along with his nephew who also became a doctor. And I uh, put it more particularly to see what they used for sore throats and lung troubles in those days. Uh, petro petroleum with hypophosphates. Fights, sorry. Now this book, if anybody wants to study any more about uh, early medical practitioners by Rex uh, Wright Sinclair, uh, was published in 2003, and he's, this is the section about Dr. Foss taken out of there, most of the detail on it you've heard already, but he says that he reported in, to, to one of these uh, overseas medical congresses having done four thyroid lobectomies with one death, and two successful uh, prostatectomies, one perineal, one suprapubic. They'd be pretty big undertakings in that time. I could not find any records, and I went through everything in the two uh, case books, I couldn't find any uh, thyroids at all. And I found one prostatectomy, which uh, was a gentleman who was widowed and who shot himself a month later. Uh, call it successful or not, I don't know. Uh, so, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Kloss went away for his annual holiday to his friend in uh, Featherston in the Wairarapa and did not come back. And I'll read the rest from some things from his obituary, which cover a few extras about his uh, life. But he, when, when he was last seen, as he left Dunedin uh, by friends, in his, he was in his usual health, and uh, he used kept this normal short. Um, short holiday. And he was when he went. He was suffering from uh, gastroenteritis. That, um, uh, the end came on suddenly. His wife, uh, on hearing he was ill, took the train to try and get there but didn't arrive on time. And the rest of the obituary says uh, that he was generally acclaimed as a most fearless and skillful surgeon and a physician of experience and right judgment. He was singularly unassuming in disposition and was much averse to posing in the limelight. It was only those who knew him intimately who were aware of the kindness of his nature and even they did not know how many kindnesses he veiled from their knowledge. Outside the practice of his profession, he was a man of many activities. Deputy uh, District Grand Master of the Grand Lodge, we've covered already, and he made a prime object of his, of his solicitude the establishment of a Masonic Orphan's Home. He was formerly president of the Otago Lawn Tennis Club, for many years a popular member of the Dunedin Bowling Club, an honorary surgeon to the Dunedin Jockey Club, at one time he took an active interest in racing, and his horse hero won the Hunt Cup at the meeting at Forbury. Uh, this was a, a memorial uh, item given to the Settlers Museum by his um, nephew, uh, 
uh, James Gunning Stevens, who was, became the Draper, we saw a picture of before. Uh, that is a rather neglected uh, last resting place in, uh, in, in the cemetery at Featherston. But um, interesting, he wrote his last will and testament as soon as he came to Dunedin and left everything to Annie. But I'll put that there so you can at least see his nice neat signature. Um, and in First <coughs> Church, again, this picture from Shana McFarlane's paintings of Otago buildings, where the Otago buildings, there is uh, a memorial plaque that his wife uh, had this, uh, against this uh, stained glass window in his memory the following year, noting his initial studentship and um, membership of the Faculty of Medicine, but also something I didn't pick up anywhere else, that he was an elder of the First Church as well, even though he lived next to Knox, Knox Church. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge some of my sources and, and help from various people. Thank you. Just a comment, actually. When I read all those case notes when I was writing my book, and I um, was able to deduce that most of the notes were written by the students mm. because you could see them. Yeah. Uh, that their name appeared somewhere then the next year or two they appeared as kind of interns I suppose. Yeah, oh, I agree. Oh, that's the conclusion I came to. I, in one of the books there's an index at the front and it says who the clerk was. One of those was um, had a had a class name that I wasn't able to track exactly. It didn't seem to be his nephew who studied medicine after him. Uh, and so there's still a few open mysteries to keep looking for. No, he, he must have been really well qualified in the surgery for the time. Would that be right? Well, I, I, I think that's uh, evident uh, just looking at the, if you can judge the qualification by the quality of what he did afterwards, he did yeah. some pretty, uh, pretty major work. Yes. I have not read all the works of the other surgeons to make a comparison, but he went away and in his six years he, of, of total training, he came back with a Master of Surgery, not, not a Bachelor of Surgery, and that is uh, a little bit of cut above, a cut above the rest, maybe. So when he, he would have done how many years of it in two? Years? He did two here. And, and, then, then, a, a and then just to get a Bachelor's Degree in, in UK, he would have had to do how many more? Another four. Four, and then two more for surgery. Well, it seems like he was away for f uh, five years. Uh, there's a little uh, movement in the dates between various sources where they went away 77 or 78. Mm. Just one other query uh, or point. Um, before the time of the Royal Commission, which was the early 90s, 1890. Yeah. Yeah. Before that, of course, physicians would take whatever came in, and I seem to remember reading in some of those information and some of the history books that one of the physicians had done a, some fancy kidney operation and <coughs> did that very well and so on. So, it, but after the commission, Royal Commission inquiry, uh, physicians no longer did surgery, whereas up to that time they just took what mm. came in and looked after them. So there was a division then between medicine and surgery. Mm. Okay. The other thing I picked up out of the Commission uh, evidence was that uh, quite a few of these surgeons had private practices, but I don't know where they were doing their operations. Dr. Dr. Batchelor had private practice, uh, Dr. Monson did, and uh, Dr. Boss. Questions? No, no more questions. Thank you, Thank you very much for a really, really insightful and fascinating blooms into uh, medical practice in the 1880s and 1890s. It's wonderful. So thank you very much, Chair. <laughs> <laughs>